Today we're at uh, Milestone Contractors Main Design Lab on the south side of Indianapolis. We're going to be videoing a uh, partial design. This will actually be the first trial of an aggregate structure. We're going to determine if there's adequate BMA and where the air voids would come out at the uh, design at the liquid content that we've chosen. We actually have some samples already prepared and ready to mix liquid with, which is what we're going to observe right now. And then uh, Dave Johnson, who is the technician that will be uh, in the video almost all the time, will be showing us uh, how he gets the aggregate samples ready. And then as we go on through the day, you'll be uh, observing basically an entire design process. I'm Jay Smitley, I work for Milestone Contractors and I'm also the chairman of the APAI Scholarship Committee. On the camera that you can't see is Brad Curry, who's the Quality Control Manager for Milestone Contractors. And uh, Dave, we're ready for you. Okay, I'm going to pour oil the peel, and the peel first and then we'll let it peel back up while I do the rubs. Dave just teared the mixing bowl. Now he's going to add aggregate and, and uh, asphalt to it. The aggregate's already in. No, this is just the bowl. Okay, he's just he's going to add the liquid. This is for the peel, which I'm just going to pour the liquid, set it back in there, let it reheat a little bit while I mix my rocks. The uh, the exact amount of binder that, or liquid that we get in each sample is very important. That's why he's being so careful with, uh, we, we like to be within a tenth of a gram, which is pretty uh, pretty hard to do when you're dealing with hot liquid and, and you've got the material in the, in the air there that you're trying to anticipate what is going to weigh. But it looks like he got it right on the money, but Dave's good, so. That's my rice. This will be for a rice or a maximum specific gravity of the, uh, of the mix at this particular aggregate structure and binder content. Again, weighing very carefully. You're going to mix the rice by hand, I assume? I will mix the yeah, because it's a small. 12.5, 9.5, I will mix by hand. So this is a 12.5, okay, this is a 12.5 millimeter mix. It is a virgin mix, which is something we don't do very often anymore. Most all of our mixes have recycle in them. Uh, this particular customer is uh, just demanding a uh, virgin mix, so that's what we're doing and observing today. Dave's mixing until all the aggregate is, is coated. That was just the coarse aggregate in the uh, sample. Now he's dumped in the fine aggregate, and he'll remix until everything is now coated. Then that will condition for two hours before we can actually process the sample. Notice that he's scraping the bottom and the side of the bowl because we want to make sure that all the fine aggregate is uh, actually in the sample and not just stuck in the bowl. That's how big a sample, Dave, about 2,000 grams? Uh, 15, it's got to be a minimum of 1,500, so okay. by the time you put the oil to this, it's going to be 1,530. Okay. And the, uh, the sample that you just 
put the liquid in the in the uh, mixing bucket four and four. That'll be about a forty-seven hundred gram. We usually shoot for forty-seven fifty. Usually puts us right there in the middle of that band. Now that sample he won't mix by hand. We'll be using something called a bucket mixer. Uh, aptly called that because the first one that came out actually used nothing but a five gallon bucket as the mixing bowl. We found out though, and Brad's showing you the uh, apparatus that does the mixing right there. They found out that a five gallon bucket would wear out pretty quickly though. So uh, what we use now are actually restaurant stainless steel stock pots which have a one inch thick aluminum bottom which takes care of our heat transfer. But for small mixing, small samples like this, or if we were doing uh, a Marshall design, uh, it's often done by hand. This goes out to other open. Cure for two hours. I'll be right back. He's going to take that and place it in another oven, set at the compaction temperature for a, a two hour cure time. And uh, it will be stirred at one hour and then re, uh, re spread out and then we will actually run the rice, which I believe is something that you will be doing in, your, in some of your lab work. Now for the two. Okay, now he's going to come back and mix the aggregate into the uh, large bowl there that uh, will hold a 4,750 gram sample that we will later compact into a uh, super paved Specimen. All the aggregates already been weighed, so uh, and, and we'll show you how that's done after we mix this sample. Can you uh, get it under that? Yep. yep. See the aggregate looking to stir back and forth to help the aggregate uh, move around in there and get it quickly over there. The paddle that he has in his hand actually brings the bottom and the side of the vessel all the same time. He just put it in the port bag, and now he's going to have the pond. Very similar to how he did the A lot of times if you're dealing with a 25 millimeter or a course 19 millimeter, if you put it all in there at once, the aggregate, the asphalt's going to go to your fine ag instead of the course ag, and you won't get the course but big rocks coated. You're right.
good to the last drop. And you can see that that is as clean as you'll ever get it, and I'll bet his hair will be really close to what it was when he started. And he's going to add liquid again for the second uh, specimen for the uh, gyratory sample. It takes two, we average two samples for every, uh, for every data point. So this will just be a repeat of what he's done before and uh, we'll skip that and come back to uh, mixing the sample. And now we're going to watch Dave put together the actual aggregate. Uh, this is going to be the aggregate for another uh, maximum specific gravity sample. The sheet that you're looking at right there is the blending sheet that he's going to go by. You can see that uh, everything is broken down into various sieve sizes for each aggregate. So Dave, why don't you go ahead and start and we'll, uh, we'll watch what you're doing. Uh, the aggregates you're using are what, a number nine stone? Nine stone, 11 stone, and 12 stone. Nine stone, 11 stone, and a 12 stone. Right now he's getting some of the coarsest aggregate from the number nines. And he's going to put... How much are you shooting for, Dave? 92.7. And you see when you get big rocks like that, you kind of have to sort through and get to the weight that you're looking for. Sometimes it comes down to just uh, picking different rocks and different combinations. Uh, it's sometimes you just go over the next edge. Yeah, it and is he's cruiser. within a half a gram of his, of his weight, so we're, he's going to call that a good weight. Now he's going to the next aggregate fraction size in the number nines. Before Dave got these aggregates in this condition, there were several, several steps. Uh, the aggregate came into the lab in buckets or bags. It was dried, sorted in, through sieves. And also, uh, as the aggregates uh, are brought in, they're tested. There are several tests that have to be, uh, be performed that we're not going to do because you actually can do aggregate testing there in your lab at trying. But, uh, each aggregate would have to have its specific gravity uh, and absorption determined by Ashto T84 and T85, whether it's a coarse or a fine. And then on the composite aggregates, once we have determined that this is the right blend of aggregates for this mix, on the composite aggregates, they'll have to do a sand equivalency test or Ashto T176. They'll check for flattening elongated particles in the mix, which is ASTM D4791. They'll check for fine aggregate angularity, HTO T304. They'll check uh, coarse aggregate angularity or crush count, which is uh, ASTM uh, D5821. And uh, if you notice, he's being very, very precise in all of these weighings. And you might wonder, uh, why would you have to be that precise? Well, we want to make sure that we can actually make this mix the way we want it here in the lab. Because if you can't make it in the lab, you don't stand a chance of making it in a plant. So uh, uh, we're, uh, we're being very, very precise in the weights. The way that he's determining how much was in there is, is from the blend sheet that you saw as we started. And, and that's determined by uh, picking an aggregate percentage uh, for each of the aggregates that we're going to use. And then using the gradation that uh, we've determined the aggregates have. And then you would simply multiply the uh, percentage that you've chosen for the aggregate, say you were going to use 25% uh, nines, you would take each sieve that you're using times 25% and, and then that times the total mass of aggregates that you want to achieve. That's how he came up with the blend sheet that he's using. Now he's switching, he's going to be taking uh, number 11s now and, and doing their individual 
massives, and uh, he'll continue this until he reaches all of the uh, aggregates, and, and he'll have a sample that is precisely representing the aggregate structure that we're uh, investigating today. And then, after that sample is heated, they'll mix the binder with it, which you've already seen them do. Dave, what's the binder content that we're actually looking at today? 5.3. 5.3% of the total mixture is actually binder. In this case, I'm sure it's PG64 minus 22. Yes. <coughs> So Dave's going to go through all of these uh, individual sieves, clear through down to the very finest, the, the fines that would be in the mix from uh, clear down as fine as face powder, actually. Okay, while we're waiting on the uh, samples to heat up, I'm going to show you a, a part of the lab equipment that is not necessarily part of the design process, but it is very important into, in the uh, quality control and quality assurance. This is an NCAT style ignition furnace, and we place samples of hot mix in this chamber and reaches a temperature of anywhere from 427 to 510 degrees Celsius. And the uh, asphalt that is in the sample will all be burnt off and exhausted. Uh, we can't show you an actual sample happening right now in this oven because it was just brought in and the, the uh, exhaust hood, the exhaust is not hooked up to it yet, but this is what it would look like. Uh, here are the baskets that the sample would go in. You would set the basket on, the, on a balance, zero it put half of the sample into the bottom, put the other half into the top of the basket, put the hole down on it. You would have gotten the tear weight of this assembly with all of this together. Now you would weigh the sample. You would bring it over to the ignition furnace. You would place it on the uh, hearth plate there, close the door, and then you would tell the, tell the ignition furnace how much that sample weighs. Uh, this is actually connected to a balance underneath. You can see the uh, scale indicator right there moving as we play with the balance. Okay. It would begin to uh, count down from the weight that you told it had been placed in there in that sample. And it would begin to burn when it reaches the uh, correct temperature. And then it would maintain whatever temperature you've chosen as your test temperature. And it would continue until three consecutive readings have a change of no more than one-tenth of one percent of the uh, weight that you started with. And then that percent of loss would be the percent of asphalt that was in that sample. That's uh, just about the industry standard anymore for uh, determining binder contents. There are still some some agencies that require extraction and uh, friends over in Ohio they require the use of the nuclear asphalt content gauge but this is uh, a very good way of determining asphalt content because it also gives you the opportunity then to uh, look at the aggregate that's left and determine the gradation of the sample. So this is uh, just one of the tools that uh, would be in any QCQA lab and, and usually in a design lab also. Okay, it's now been two hours since Dave put the uh, sample for the uh, maximum specific gravity or the rice in condition. He's taking it out of the oven. He's going to spread it out. And uh, again, with Scrape everything out of the uh, mix, the bowl that it conditioned in, so that we have uh, everything that should be in the sample there. So spread that out on the uh, on the table surface there, so that it can begin to cool. And then 
then we will break it up so that there are no fine aggregate particles larger than one quarter inch stuck together. Isn't that right, Dave? What we said? Yes. <laughs> out of a 300 degree oven that does take a little bit of time to cool down to where you can grab a hold of it in his hands. So. trying to separate the larger particles away from the rest of it. That way it's just not much less that he actually has to break up once he starts breaking up the sample. Spread out like this, the cooling process doesn't take all that long, so it'll not be too long so he can start grabbing a hold of it with his hands and breaking it up. And we'll continue the test then. Okay, Dave's now going to get one of the uh, gyratory specimens out and get it ready to go into the gyratory compactor. He's just taking the mold out of the, uh, the oven. It's been in there and it's at the same temperature as the mixing temperature of the mix. He's placed the filter paper in the bottom and a funnel on the top. He's going to uh, pour all the mix in at once. Proper way of uh, Gyratory. Now what he's doing is scraping all of the residue that uh, decided to stick in the pan out so that we have, as we tried to do the whole way through, every bit of the sample staying with the sample. A buttered pan. Yeah, yeah, the pan was actually buttered, we call it. In other words, it had residue in it that was stuck there the way uh, what will stick and you can't get off is already on the pan and it's not part of the uh, sample to be placed in. That sample was stirred after it had been in an hour and then another hour of conditioning.
place the top filter on. Now he's going to the gyratory compactor. He's locking the specimen and the mold into the compactor. It's now locked in and he's now starting the compactor through this process. How many gyrations is this one? 75. It's the 75 gyration mix. You can see the display there on the compactor. It will display the pressure and the angle. It's going to induce an angle pretty soon. It will also display the height. If you remember when we were mixing the sample, Dave said we're looking for 4,750 grams. We know from experience that this should create a sample that is between 110 and 120 millimeters. It's now inducing the angle and gyrating. The angle is set at 1.16 degrees internal to the axis of the, uh, of the mold. It's uh, actually gyrating or rotating on the inside at 30 revolutions per minute. The external angle, we were looking at the outside of the, uh, the mold versus the, the inside, it would be going out to an excursion of 1.25 degrees off of the center axis. See the display there, how many gyrations it's gone through, and, and that is reading the internal angle. I assume and that is the external. Okay. You see the pressure is maintained constantly at 600 kilopascals. You see the height there, we are approaching uh, 117 millimeters of height of specimen. If we hit 115, we are exactly on the, the uh, specification. The sample must be 115 plus or minus 5 millimeters. If it's not, it's not a valid sample. We would have to throw it away, which would be a lot of work for nothing, right, Dave? Exactly. Yeah. I think we're going to be just fine because we're now at 60 gyrations and we're at 116 millimeters, so I think Dave must have his stuff together. Five gyrations. Now Dave needs to get in there and take the top off the mold. He's now extruding the sample. He's going to leave it uh, come up to where he can get that top filter paper off and uh, leave it up where he can start to cool it a little bit. Uh, otherwise, uh, Sometimes you can have a real uh, bad experience. You know, everything can fall apart. He's going to just leave that set there with a fan blowing on it for uh, about 10 minutes, I assume. And then we will process it. This is a printout showing the, uh, the height that each gyration, the, uh, the gyratory compactor uh, prints this out. You see we finished at 115.1 millimeters. That's almost perfect. So uh, the 4,750 gram sample that we mixed, uh, that would be uh, 
if, if this does turn out to be a, a good aggregate blend and the right asphalt content, that would be the, uh, the, the mass of each specimen that we would want to compact as we do uh, quality control work on, the, on this. What we're doing right now is breaking up the maximum specific gravity sample or the rice, trying to get it to that condition that it specifies in, uh, what's the, what's the uh, spec number? T1. You're the one who did numbers. I know, I forgot what the number is. Anyway, it's the max uh, specification. Uh, T209, T209, I believe. Yeah. And uh, we're just making sure that there's no big particles stuck together and, and no fine aggregates stuck together bigger than a quarter of an inch. This has only been in actual time just about uh, 12 minutes since we laid it out and it's just the right temperature to grab a hold of. It's still warm enough to uh, be pliable and separate easily, but it doesn't burn our little hands. Whoops. Okay. Dave. Dave saved me there, he saved that rock, otherwise we'd been in trouble. Whoop, that hurt again. I got it. Okay, looks like we're there, Dave. Let's put that scratch on here. Yeah, I don't know. Dave's going to get all this uh, raked together, get it into a bowl, and transfer it into a vacuum technometer. We will weigh that sample dry. Okay, we're getting ready to complete the uh, maximum specific gravity or rice test now. What you're looking at is the balance with the picnometer on it, and you can see that the scale is reading zero. In other words, it's been teared. Now Dave's going to take the mix that we uh, separated, put into the uh, picnometer. Scraping that last little bit off right under the picnometer so that we know we didn't lose any of it. Now he'll weigh it. Fifteen hundred twenty-eight point six grams. That would be the dry weight of the mix. Now he's placing it into a water bath, making sure that the uh, sample fills. The water bath is a controlled temperature of uh, 77 Fahrenheit or 25 degrees centigrade. Now Dave's taking the uh, picnometer with the sample and water. We're going to put it in the uh, on a vibrating table. And he's going to apply a vacuum to it. The vacuum must stay between 25.5 plus or minus 3.5. In other words, 25 to 30 millimeters. And it'll sit there and vibrate and remain under that uh, 
into that vacuum for 15 minutes. You can see the uh, manometer there is uh, coming down. I'm sure Dave has it all cranked in exactly, so we'll stop right there in the mid-range of that, uh, that pressure requirement. According to the specification, you have to reach the uh, top of the range in 90 seconds. I see he's got uh, 20 seconds to go. He's just about there. But he just made it, so we're good. So that's going to continue to sit there and for 15 minutes, and then we will uh, weigh it in water. Okay, we're just about at the end of the test. The 15 minute cycle is, is done. He's now removing the, uh, the vacuum from the, uh, from the sample. Uh, that needs to come off pretty slowly so that you don't uh, disturb the, the mix. You can see the pressure gauge there, how slow it's coming down. Once you get down below uh, about 10 millimeters or so, you, you pretty well just open it up and let it off. You're not going to do any damage to the sample. And if you have eight floaters, you're supposed to push them back there. Yeah. What they do? Now, now he's going to come uh, over and he's going to suspend it in water under the balance, which he has already teared. He's going to set on a hook. Completely submerged in, in water. How long will you leave that in there? Two minutes. Ten minutes. So in ten minutes, we'll uh, read that weight. And the uh, <clears throat> the weight of the picnometer has already been determined. Uh, the weight of the picnometer in water there, which would be D, as you're looking at your uh, paperwork, is. Uh, 1,336.9 grams. Okay, you can hear the beeper going off. We've reached the end of the 10 minute period in the, uh, in the water. And you see our weight there. What are you calling it, Dave? 2250? 2249.9. 2249.9. And you're not doing a dry back, correct? No. Okay, so this test is complete. You now have all the information that you would need to calculate the maximum specific gravity of that mix. Okay, now we have uh, one of the specimens has been cooled. And uh, we're getting the dry weight of that specimen. This is specimen number one, 4,738.0. Now he's going to take that specimen and he's going to put it in the temperature controlled water bath, weighing it below balance. How long are you going to leave that in there, Dave? Four minutes. Four minutes. Spec is three to five. Right. So we're going for four minutes. It will hang there and uh, it will stabilize weight is what we're actually looking for in that four minute time frame. You can see the uh, the balance is moving around. So uh, we'll come back in four minutes and uh, take that read. We're just about to the end of our time. There we go. There's the beeper going. So our weight in water is 
2759.2. Now Dave's going to take that out, let the water drip off of it back into the bath. He's going to blot it with a damp towel. And the weight that he's going to get from this is uh, called saturated surface dry. The pill is saturated in the uh, water bath, but the surface has been damp dried, actually would be a better term for it. I'm weighing it now again. This will be the SSD weight. 47, 43, Okay, now we're bringing the second uh, gyratory specimen to the uh, balance. You see the weight there, 47, 33, 0.9. Now again, stick it in the uh, water bath, suspend it under the balance for four minutes. And we'll come back and get that weight for you. Okay, here we go with the uh, ten, four minute period over on the second specimen. And our weight in water is 27.55 point. We're going to call it six. That's where we were when we started. Dave is going to again uh, blot it with the uh, damp cloth to get it to the SSD uh, condition. And here is our SSD weight of specimen number two, 47. 38.2. Completed uh, that trial set of specimens, we'll calculate the uh, maximum specific gravity and the bulk specific gravity of both of the pills. Average those, we'll determine the uh, VMA that's in that aggregate structure the air voids at that particular asphalt content and we'll judge whether that's a good aggregate structure for this uh, for this mix. If it is, then the next procedure in the design would be to mix another set of gyratory specimens at a half percent lower and then two more specimens at a half percent higher and one percent higher so that we have four points to plot our curve to pick the asphalt content that will give us 4% air voids. After that's all done and we've picked our spot, then we would run another sample at the actual chosen binder content and verify that it does indeed meet all the requirements. If that happens, then we would do something called a TSR, uh, which is to uh, judge the moisture susceptibility and damage that uh, we could expect in, a, uh, in, in the pavement. Uh, this is a very lengthy process, requires actually days to complete, and so we're sure not going to show you that on this, but uh, what we've done today will give you a, a good general idea of how a uh, super paved gyratory mix is, is prepared and how we would do a design. Hope it's been helpful. Thanks.